have to thank, though, our sponsors, Dario Strings. You know, if you want to get your strings changed, if you have an instrument that needs the strings changed tomorrow, they're going to be changing them for free. Um, so that's a pretty good deal. So stop by the D'Addario folks booth and uh, have your strings changed if you need them changed. Also, they're recycling strings, so they're trying to be green. So stop by D'Addario and thank them. And also, we want to thank the, the show peop, uh, capo people for sponsoring this stage. Well, holy <laughs> moly. <laughs> Well, this guy's going to hang out with John Rossbach for a little while. You know John, he's been a long-time stage manager for this festival, Winterhawk and Greyfox. We couldn't do this festival without John Rossbach, so give him a great big hand, will you? You know, I'm just going to let him take over from here, but we do thank you for being here at the Creekside Stage, and please don't forget to support the Bluegrass Kids Academy. And thanks again to Bluegrass Unlimited for helping to make that happen as well. So buy your raffle tickets and support the Creekside Stage. Welcome John Rossbach and Peter Rowan. So where'd you come in from today, Peter? Well, just down the road, a little B&B &B in the woods. <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, came in from uh, Denver yesterday. Uh -huh. Well, folks. Any of you who have been around Bluegrass long remember the times when, every time when Peter Rowan takes the stage here, and uh, man, those days way back when, when we were we were younger and more unruly, and we we go till the cows yeah. were ready to get up. I remember you and I actually had a huge fight on stage. We did. We we, uh, we can laugh about it now, but we weren't laughing that night. It was, it was, there was a curfew, or the sound crew was was in, the sound crew was mutinying. And they, they were, um, I'll tell you, I uh, I've been the stage manager here for 32 years, and I've only lost it twice, but that was one of them. <laughs> Yonder Mountain was the other one. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been working from 9 in the morning to 3 the next morning. So, anyway, right. folks, we are, are so honored to have Peter Rowan here. He's been a favorite at the original version of the other site, was the Berkshire Mountains Bluegrass Festival. Uh, that morphed into the Winterhawk Bluegrass Festival. And that morphed, morphed into the Gray Fox Family Bluegrass Festival. And Peter Rowan was a staple at all of them. And I remember the first time I saw you at Berkshire Mountains in 76. And uh, then I JD saw you. J.D. Crow was my band. <laughs> remember? And then I saw Bobby, you. Bobby uh, on the fiddle there. And yes, that. and uh, our man from New Jersey on the mandolin. Uh, Barry Mitterhoff. Barry Mitterhoff. Very brief. And Tex Logan. <laughs> the next, yeah, the next time I saw you here uh, was with Tex Logan. And uh, anyway, let's go back a bit. Your family was a musical family. You have siblings who are musical. You had an uncle that played guitar. Is, I'm, I'm told he taught you how to play. The actual uncle who taught me how to play played ukulele. And uh, I have a song about that. Oh, well, let's check it out. <laughs> Peter, do you play the ukulele? I do. I, I made a record in Hawaii a couple of years ago. Oh, aloha. Yeah. I heard, about my aloha. I heard about that, my aloha. Peter has recorded in so many genres. I mean, bluegrass has always been a center theme in him, but he's done blues, he's done reggae, he's done Tex-Mex, he's done folky stuff, he's done old-timey stuff, he's done singer-songwriter, you name it, he's done it. Yeah. It's the connection between the between the mysterious forms of music, you know, nonverbal expression. I was a pretty shy kid, so music was uh, important for me to find a way to communicate. And I, I had this uncle, and his name was Uncle Jimmy. We're, we're getting a bass wolf on the monitor for his guitar. And, uh, Anybody 
know the name of this tune? actually a Hawaiian tune I know. called Pu'alilio. It came out in 1915 uh, by a blind mandolin player in Hawaii named uh, Johnny Almeida. And if you're ever lucky enough to hear this original recording, you'll hear how the young Bill Monroe heard this music and incorporated Hawaiian music in, into bluegrass. And I'll let you do the research. But uh, it's... You know, Bill had this music that he always talked about. He would call it, and I'll speak in his language. He said, to him, my other music, you know, I'd play it all the time, but my fans, they, they expect me to play bluegrass, so I must play, play the bluegrass. And it was like, you mean the father of bluegrass has another music? <laughs> <laughs> and we would ask him questions. And would it have a dobro? He, it, would, it would have a slide guitar, but not a dobro. No, no. You know, well, what about a guitar? He said, yeah, it might, it might have a small guitar too, you know. I said, small guitar like mandolin? You know? well, what do you call them little guitars? You know, he, he, a ukulele? He said, that's it, that's it, that's what you call it. So Bill had this other side to him, you know, that was a ten, very tender side. Uh, and best we can figure is that he heard this song, Pu'alilia, when he was uh, lifting barrels of oil up in the, in the Chicago boatyards and Detroit uh, oil refineries. He and his brothers would go up there, and that's where they could get work if you came up from the mountains of Kentucky, came up to the north, industrial north, the Detroit auto industry was just starting to boom. And uh, Bill's first gig was as a dancer uh, on the WLS barn dance. And uh, there was a Hawaiian duo that was on that show. And best we can figure, that's probably, unless he heard it on a record, which is, could be very true because his parents were huge music lovers and they had a Victrola. Um, but we think that, that it might have been on the WLS barn dance that he heard, you know, Pu'alilia, which became his great song, Kentucky Waltz. Thank you very much. <laughs> so my story starts with... from the Navy, from New Caledonia. He brought coconut bras and grass skirts for the ladies. And he was strumming on a C.F. Martin baritone ukulele. <laughs> Uncle Jimmy, Uncle Jimmy, Uncle Jimmy in the Navy. To you. I want my ukulele down in old Honolulu. I never knew what uh, <laughs> I never knew he used to say that all the time. 
the grown-ups would, you know, it'd be like, especially like a Memorial Day, we'd have a family party. And Uncle Jimmy would, he was from the Navy, you know, so he was the good time guy. He knew all the songs, he played the ukulele, and he, he taught me Bye Bye Blackbird, Five Foot Two, Ain't She Sweet, and all these old swing tunes. But he, when he, he'd get his drink and he'd go, Hubba hubba ding ding, I mean, I mean. <laughs> and I never knew what that meant until I started recording in Honolulu down the street from the Hubba Hubba bar. <laughs> and there it was, and it's still there. So, you know, it's the connection between things that interests me a lot. Well, folks, when I asked about his uncle, and I didn't know his name was Jimmy, I didn't expect folks to get the answer about his uncle sung and played to me in the form of a song. Thank you very much. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah. Now, you morphed into being an acoustic blues guitar player, didn't you? Well, my first love, the first thing, you know, I had a little rock and roll band around Boston. But, you know, we used to play, you know, you know. Was this the Cupids? The Cupids. We were yes. called the Cupids. I was, a. Uh, there was only one guy in the band who had a license. And it was the drummer, Chris Scott, and he used his dad's station wagon. And we were all 15 years old and going around Boston, you know, thinking we were going to be like maybe the Everly Brothers or Buddy Holly was a, a big one for us and did a little Chuck Berry music and uh, Elvis of course and uh, the best gig I can remember was playing May Day for a Catholic girls school <laughs> <laughs> they had the Maypole and everything it was wild and it was held at the at the Canton Canton Canton, you know, Canton, Massachusetts, the canoe club, the Canton Canoe Club. And we were five guys, and there must have been about 35 girls, and so we had fun. We had a, we had a chance to dance with everybody, and, and we were, I mean, we just passed 14, you know, I and mean, it was a really innocent time, and, uh, but I, you could see that people really liked the music, and um, that, that uh, as, as somebody who, you know, I felt fairly uh, shy most of the time, and that, that being able to relate to people was a, was a kind of buzz, you know. Yeah, was, you were slinging an electric guitar at that point. Well, yeah, I, I was, until I saw Joan Vias, somebody went, who, that I had a day job work in construction said, he said, he just looked at me one day, he said, Rowan, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. I said, well, I don't? And he goes, no, you should go to Harvard Square where people like you hang out. <laughs> so I went to Harvard Square and that's where I heard Eric Von Schmidt. And we, one night after one of our gigs, we sang doo-wop with Joan Baez down by the Club 47 on old Mount Auburn Street. But, um, yeah, I played a, a Telecaster, that was my gig, but also a, a little Mahogany Martin with a, a, a pickup in the sound hole, a De Armand pickup, because I thought some of Buddy Holly's tunes had that, you know, had an acoustic quality to the sound. And, uh, but, you know, as I started to understand you know, what, what shocked me was, you know, from Chuck Berry being... To hear Lightning Hopkins going, you know... You know, the, the Texas blues. Yeah. And I like that. And so there's the lead belly material, you know, I mean, we just listening to records as much as we could, you know, we had from 45s to LPs, we were in the transition stage there in the early, the late 50s, early 60s. And I think the, the, the big moment was when Life magazine had a picture of Elvis Presley on the front of it. it I mean, there was the, the change in America at that moment from, from you know, kind of like a middle of the road you know, kind of pop music 
to Womp Bamba Loom Bamba Lom Bam Boom. You know? And there was a picture of Elvis on the front of of Life magazine and he he just looked evil and he there was a group and he, he had the microphone, he was like you know, and he was pointing at this girl who had a camera and and you could see her, she was melting around the edges. And, <laughs> And so, I mean, you know, Everly Brothers, beautiful, you know, that harmony, uh, Ike Everly, the Everly Brothers' dad was, you know, real good friends with Bill Monroe, and uh, also good friends with the black guitarist that Bill learned from, named Arnold Schultz, who was from New Orleans, but lived up in Kentucky during the summer months as a laborer, and was a good friend of his uncle, Uncle Penn, uh, you know, uh, and that lineage of guitar picking came down through uh, Chet Atkins and um, and also uh, uh, Merle, Merle Travis. Travis, yeah, Dark as a Dungeon, the Roll On Buddy. Uh, that kind of finger picking thing that Earl Scruggs sort of brought to bluegrass too, but it's, it's there, uh, especially if you listen to Bill Monroe's early recordings with Clyde Moody playing guitar. He's playing the, the whole... Uh, That's just the blues, you know. Yes, well, when I heard Lightning Hopkins, I realized that Chuck Berry was also a part of the tradition, and we started looking into that. And you know, I mean, it was at that time, you know, people like Muddy Waters were coming up and playing Newport Folk Festival, and great piano player like Otis Spahn who had played on Chuck Berry's records was in Muddy Waters band and seeing these connections kind of blew things away for me in terms of you know how could a kid from New England even think that he could play music from this other part of America uh, so however there was a guy named Joe Val Joe Valiente, Joseph Valiente. And uh, he saw my predicament as a, a, a kid wanting to learn uh, uh, more than a folky version of things. Uh, he, uh, 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 what I wanted to learn was something I felt had deeper roots, and Joe knew that stuff. And he was playing at the time with Bob Siggins uh, and uh, John Cook the, and Fritz Richmond, the Charles River Valley Boys. And he was also playing with Jim Rooney and Bill Keith, and of course Bill had been up here many a year playing over the years at this festival and uh, lived nearby in Woodstock. Uh, and it was, uh, it was Joe who taught me, uh, we'll be doing some of that stuff today, uh, some Leuven Brothers and Stanley Brothers things that, I mean, if it wasn't for Joe, I, I would have missed out on a lot. And uh, so I used to go over to his house when my mother's station wagon about 6.30 in the evening and hijack Joe out of there. And his wife, Thelma, was not happy that she would, uh, Joe said, he, she said, your hillbilly friends are waiting for you. <laughs> Is this all before college even? Huh? Is this all before college even? Yeah, yeah, it was. I was, I was. Well, 15 when we were out there starting to discover this stuff by being out in the city at night playing our gigs. And then 17, 18, 19, all those years was was discovering uh, uh, the music around Harvard Square and, um, and going away to school. And I went to school up at uh, Colgate University <laughs> and, uh, in Hamilton, New York uh, by beautiful Lake Casanova. And um, we had a band up there called the Bonnie Hill Boys. That was, was Gary Sanford in that? Gary Sanford was in that band, yeah. And uh, Andy Staub and uh, Petzl. Uh, oh, is this a bluegrass band, per It was se? strictly a bluegrass band, per se. I mean, we, we were just playing what we heard, you know, just trying to do it. And, uh, but we used to play for the local people, the local farmers, the, the college kids, they couldn't care less about bluegrass. But we played in this bar down there in, um, in the little town of uh, Irville. Yeah, we played in a bar in Irville. And there were a couple of characters down there who were, uh, they were country people, I'll put it 
put it that way, they they show their appreciation in different ways than a college crowd, you know. Well, I lived in that area for 25 years. I used to play that same bar in Oklahoma. That's how I knew Gary. So, yeah, um, I, I didn't know, uh, staying in school, I, I, I didn't know what to do, you know. Um, but I, I did my best, you know. I was even the cheerleader my first year. All right. <laughs> rah, rah, rah. Now, what got you into the upper echelon? Like, when you hang out with Bill Keith, I, I quit gather. school. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I left college and went back and went, went to work with Bill Keith. And uh, Bill Keith and Jim Rooney were a happening duo, trio. So I basically took Joe's place and played mandolin in, the, in that band. And uh, one day Bill Monroe called, I mean, one day Bill Keith called me up and said, Hello, Pete. And I said, Yeah. And he goes, Bill Monroe's coming up north. Bill Keith, not to be too long-winded, but um, That's okay. Bill Keith had been in a bluegrass boy. You know, he'd already been in Nashville. And the reason he left Bill Monroe's band was, not only was, was it a lot of time to be on the road, because once you get a good band, what do you do? You gotta work, you know? And, uh, but the Pete Seeger, it was an issue about Pete Seeger, who had been blackballed from a TV show called Hootenanny yeah. mm -hmm. because of his supposed leftist leanings, you know? And also my mentor, my real blues mentor was Josh White. I got to play with him and uh, he, he was destroyed by the, the, the McCarthy era stuff. He lost all his credibility in the folk world, you know, but Josh Wright was the best blues guitarist in the 40s. He had he, a sting on that guitar. Man, no, he was fabulous. He went to New York and, you know, looking for success and he got sucked into, you know, whatever, you know, you're hanging out with Woody Guthrie and Cisco Houston, and Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee and, yeah. and, and all the people who threw those parties were communists, you know, they were leftists, you know, and uh, and, you know, it was a terrible time in America, and I think people are really worried about it happening again, where you, yeah. the citizens are, like, reporting on each other. Uh, yeah, it can't happen here. But, you know, that, that was the politics. Even Dylan walked away from it, you know? He, they were trying to honor him as a representative of something, probably something good. But he, he walked away from the folk music establishment. It repudiated it. He got up on stage and he, to accept for his acceptance speech for like being a, an artist, a liberal-minded artist was, he said, I know how, I know how Oswald, Oswald feels. He said, I could be a Oswald. And they were just, that was the end of it. No. <laughs> he had no more credibility in the leftist folk music. <laughs> it was like, what? Okay. So but, how'd, you, how'd you meet Bill? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so Bill Keith called me up and he said, now, Bill, Keith, Bill is wanting to put a band together. He's asked me to put a band together. Would you come and play guitar? I said, yeah, I mean, that'd be great. With three or four dates in New England ending up at Doc Watson's birthday party at Symphony Hall, maybe? Or Jordan Hall, I can't remember. Uh, but Bill Keith warned me, he said, you know, in, you have to, you can't call me Bill in Bill Monroe's band because there can only be one Bill in Bill's band. So you have to call me Brad. <laughs> that was his middle name, Bradford. So I had to call him Brad Keith. And, uh, and he, and uh, what else, he said something else too, he said, and I said, I'm sorry, but you can't play mandolin, only Bill plays the mandolin, and I thought, well, that's interesting, that he thought I might want to play mandolin, but, you know, so I started playing guitar full time, because with Jim Rooney, he plays guitar, and uh, I was, I was doing the mandolin work in that band, um, so Bill came up, and uh, we, uh, we went up to Vermont, and um, it was a little different atmosphere than Bill had been used to as an Opry star, you know. Basically, he was a country music star. And uh, here we are at, at, a, at the, this fiddle convention in, in somewhere, Stowe, Vermont, and it's snow all over the ground. And, and Bill, you know, it was like, 
we're all staying at people's houses, and it's like, whoa, you know. And, but Bill, you know, that's the, the beginning of the new Bill. Because Mike Seeger and Ralph Rensler put an article out in uh, Sing Out magazine saying, the daddy of bluegrass music. Because Flat and Scruggs were getting a lot of publicity and getting a lot of uh, acknowledgement for their TV shows, Beverly Hillbillies, whereas the father of bluegrass music was was still a, a working musician, you know, paying union dues and going out on the road. And I mean, as were Flat and Scruggs, but Bill didn't have that kind of exposure, you know. His 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 uh, his a uh, rootsy kind. It was a little more gnarly, you know. And but when you hear the music now and you listen to it, it's like uh, we heard a cut today with Mac Wiseman traveling down this lonesome road, and you could hear that the production is trying to make it pop music. They're really trying to make bluegrass be a popular music, a country music. The same thing happened with the Stanley Brothers when they went up to uh, King Records in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, Sid Nathan thought Carter had a lot of commercial potential. Uh, he only had a couple of years to live anyway, but um, they did, uh, they went so far as to do a finger pop in time. Yeah, anybody ever heard their version of finger, finger pop in time? Hank Ballard and the Midnighters. Yes. And they had Hank Ballard and the Midnighters, who I used to dance slow dance to and do the dirty boogie to when I was a rock and roll 14 year old. And you know, I just found out from Moon Mullen's grandson, we were just up in Cincinnati talking about all this. And uh, they also had a snare player, a snare drum player, a young, a young black singer named James Brown. Uh, and he played on that session. That's the, that's the rumor. Anyway. He, he also played on the Stanley Brothers 1961 version of Rolling on Those Rubber Wheels. Is that right? That was, maybe that's what, what it was then. James Brown playing snare drum for the Stanley Brothers. <laughs> that guitar has got a little wolf coming on the mic. Too. That's all right. I won't, the video of that? I won't put it close. No kidding. Yeah, I imagine it would have been. Yeah, so at the end of that three-day tour, you know, and now Bill is out living with the audience. And I mean, that was just not, you know, but he could see that the new generation was more about... Um, believing in the community of bluegrass, which was a new thing for him, because Bill Monroe had been a huge country music star and was on the Grand Ole Opry 25 years while I was with him. And um, he, you know, there's a certain distance between the audience and the, and the musicians. And of course there still is, you know, I mean, because musicians make their living doing the, what y'all, great fans come to hear and be part of and, and sharing what we do is, is huge for us. I mean, it's really, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, now we get to really do it, you know, play live. And uh, and so Bill, they, uh, Ralph Rensselaer and Mike Seeger, names you may not remember or have ever heard of, but uh, Mike Seeger had the New Law, New Law City Ramblers, uh, which is a a great old-time revival group, and Ralph Rinsler managed Doc Watson and Bill Monroe, and put together the Newport Folk Festival and Newport and and the Federal Department of uh, Folk Life Department of the Smithsonian. So these guys were, you know, they had the historical perspective, and they put out this article called the daddy of bluegrass music, where they explained that Bill Monroe was the progenitor, and you know, they, they had been involved in bluegrass a long time. And I think the message got to Bill by, uh, via the fans, via you know, all that. He was loved not for his uh, fame and glory of being a country music star, but for being kind of our, the father of the music, you know? And, uh, cause they officialized it. They put it in the in the magazine, and uh, I know that that's where Bill started to kind of really, you know, he's formidable. You know, he was pretty, you know, he his jokes were like head scratchers. You, you know, kind of like the Zen the Zen master has spoken. But what did he? What? <laughs> well, when they were started calling him the father of bluegrass, now I've heard tell that 
the Omanor considered that your voice was similar to his, and therefore when you and he would sing together, he probably felt like you were some sort of a son. Uh, and that was before his son was playing in the band, wasn't it? No, or? Jimmy was playing bass when I played yeah. guitar. Yeah. And uh, I thought Jimmy did great taking over on the guitar. Uh, um, but Bill used to stand behind me and yell at me on stage. <laughs> it, it, well, put it this way. We played the first show, you know, and uh, on the Opry, and I sang at his request, and I only sang it a couple of times, was, you know, Wash my hands in muddy water Wash my hands but they wouldn't come clean I tried to do like my daddy told me But I must have washed my hands in a muddy stream And I kept thinking, my father, I, I, my, he's not going to like me singing that I tried to do what my daddy told me, you know But actually Bill at that point was my father, so um, I, it was his request, he, he said that. He said that's your number. You know, I, w I wanted to sing Dark Hollow because Dell sang Dark Hollow, and that had been sort of the, the guitar player's tune. You know, I thought that's what you did. But he asked me to sing that. Wash my hands in muddy water. You know. And then uh, the next week we came back and he said, Pete, we've had a lot of folks uh, call in, a lot of cards and letters. They say you sound good. He said, and that's a good thing, they like you. They say you sound a lot like me. He said, that's not a good thing. <laughs> now, when he... He used to stand behind me and go, sing it like Pete Roan. <laughs> uh, he often got people's names wrong, and I always wondered, you would have a better take on this than me. Was he sometimes twisting the knife by mispronouncing names, or was that just a bill? Uh, people suspected him of, of twisting the knife. I never heard him. I mean, Gene Lowinger was from New Jersey, and Bill, without fail, would introduce him as the world's only Jewish bluegrass cowboy. <laughs> I don't think so. No, man, no. I think he was making you know, trying to take take the onus off the the whole thing of, of uh, the, the suspicion suspicion of the anti-Semitism and racism. Well, when I of, say twisting the knife, I mean there was a sense of a wry sense of sardonic humor in it, wasn't there? P. Rollins. Yeah. Well, I mean, he used to introduce Lamar Greer from the land of the senators. <laughs> Lamar Greer. I mean, well, yeah, but see, Gene was was a super sensitive kid. And I think he just wanted to bring Gene up, you know, bring him up to, to where... I, mean, I don't know what the response to that introduction would have been, you know, except really, you know, he gave you a chance to speak to the public, you know. He would say things like, and, and from the great state of Massachusetts, you know, uh, he's a Yankee boy, but he can pick the guitar and sing good bluegrass, make a little Pete Rones. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I thought Pete Rohn 